Greetings, and thank you for joining the SANS ICS team for an ICS hot take video. In this video, Jason Dealey, Jeff Shearer, and Don C. Weber will be using the event that occurred at the Aldsmar Florida Water Facility to discuss some ICS security and response concepts. We will cover information about normal operations and some of the considerations needed to prepare for and respond to an incident in an ICS environment. If you would like to see more content like this, please like and subscribe to the SANS ICS channel. All right, thanks, uh, thanks for joining me, guys. Uh, Jeff Shearer and Jason Dealey joining me to talk about the incident or, or to use the incident that, that happened at the Aldsmar, Florida water facility as a catalyst to kind of talk about and understand industrial control systems, industrial control system security, and the management of those facilities. So I want to get started, but let's let's go ahead so everybody understands, you know, who our experiences, uh, what our experiences are. Uh, I'll start with myself. Uh, I'm, I'm Don Weber, certified SANS instructor. I teach the ICS 410 class. I work for Cutaway Security, and we provide uh, information security um, guidance and assessments for industrial control system environments. I really come at it from the IT side, uh, the IT security side, uh, and you know, I've uh, definitely I'm glad to have both Jeff and Jason here because you guys are going to provide the OT side. So, um, you know, Jeff, let, why don't you let everybody know where you're from? Sure. My name is Jeff Shear. I also work for Sands Institute, and I am one of the co-authors, like Jason is, of the ICS 612. Uh, I am in my 37th year of working on in the automation space for all kinds of different industries. And uh, I just uh, have been blessed to be working with SANS to bring security awareness to the OT crowd. Jason? Yes, hi, uh, Jason Dealey. So yes, I also work uh, primarily with SANS, um, assisting with course and curriculum development, as well as any other educational component around the space. I've uh, been in the industry for 20, I guess 21 years. So not quite as long as Jeff, but uh, we both have lived some pretty interesting lives across many different sectors and industries and um, around not only the operational side and the technology, but just helping to deal with some of the nuances in trying to uh, move security forward within these environments. Awesome. Uh, thanks both. Uh, but before we get started, I mean, because people are going to be looking at this uh, um, in the future and, you know, uh, right now in 2021, we, it's it's uh, um, right out there in the news right now what happened at Altmar. But let me kind of just do a recap uh, recap uh, around all of that. Uh, so there's a water facility um, uh, serving the community within Altmar, Florida, and uh, attackers were able to access that facility uh, by gaining uh, entry through uh, the Team Viewer application. So a, 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 an application that provide, provides remote access to a system and gives you a, a display of what's actually on that system. Those, uh, the display that was presented to, to that attacker, to that user, uh, was their human machine interface or basically a representation of the process and they were able to manipulate it. So the HMIs get provide a view and control into the process. While that person was on there, uh, they made some modifications and they actually upped the uh, amount of sodium hydroxide that was being uh, put into the water system. Uh, went from like just like 100 parts per million to 11,000 parts per million. Uh, fortunately, an operator was uh, from the facility um, also saw the same display. The mouse movements uh, um, were displayed to him. The, um, the change was displayed to him and he could, uh, that person instantly went and uh, uh, changed those settings back. I'm not sure if he, I don't have the full story and a lot of the details aren't out there about that, but that's a recap of, of what's going on around this. Um, when I first heard about this, you know, the first thing I thought about was, okay, yeah, all right, somebody left access to the internet to one of their systems. Um, we've been talking about how they shouldn't be doing this, uh, but we've come to expect the fact that there is some things that are exposed out there. It's unfortunate, but, um, you know, and certainly that's what we're trying to educate people around and to move away from. And the, and the message is definitely getting out there. 
but uh, um, the, the other thing that I thought, and, and I'm coming from a non-OT background, uh, but my knowledge of the OT field is that that operator did exactly what he was supposed to be doing. So can you guys kind of help us understand, um, you know, uh, what was probably the experience of that operator there, um, you know, what, uh, the actions that he took, and is that typical, atypical, that, those types of things? So I'll, I'll start and then Jason jump in here and add more commentary to it. But um, so it is not uncommon for experts in a field or operators to need assistance. And so remote access is a very popular option to engineer into a system because factories are made of machines or in this particular case, it's made of pumping stations and other things. And so it's not so uncommon to want some expert to help you, guide you through how to run a process or run a machine. And so um, because of the workforce that we're in today, getting remote access is, is really a common thing. So having that in, in the system is a common thing to do. It's also fairly common to not understand the technology enough to secure it by OT people, and I'm speaking as an OT person. So we're gonna use availability and help way over uh, secured and no remote access. So we need help running things. So it is not that uncommon to see this kind of situation. Um, Jason, I... Yeah, I think we can extend on that as far as the type of expertise that they're looking, they need outside of systems with, you know, these, these systems, um, though engineered extremely well to run, you know, mostly autonomous, um, there are going to be cases where, you know, certain elements of, of the way the system operates does require a level of expertise that they may not have on staff and likely do not have on staff. And so, you know, they'll have, it's kind of like you're going to have a generalist group of, of maintenance folks that are going to be able to maintain the normal operation. But when it gets to, hey, I've got this one little problem with this dosing system or whatever, whether it's chlorine or, you know, sodium hydroxide, you, you're, you're going to lean on external expertise because in the external remote support team, they're going to be accessing people and individuals that are actually supporting multiple different municipalities to be able to, you know, work through certain issues and problems that come up. So you know, to have that person travel around, especially, you know, over the last year, which, you know, has its own set of restrictions, um, being able to do it, you know, on the fly and on demand, is, it's just going to help the uptime and availability of those systems, as Jeff alluded to. Mm -hmm. So what, what about the actions that, uh, um, you know, obviously, you know, in my experience, all the OT people that have, uh, um, the operators, you know, they're, they're really proud of their processes. They want to keep everything. They understand the responsibility, especially for the community related things like uh, um, utilities, energy, um, water, you know, the, the process is key for the public. And so his, uh, um, that person's actions um, to uh, um, not only protect the system, uh, but are there typically people, are there 24 seven eyes on, on these things? Um, uh, was it just lucky that this happened during business hours, like during the day? Um, you know, what, what's the expectation? What, uh, what's the common thing around that? Um, I would just put out there that it's going to vary to some degree based on each unique, um, we'll call it municipal system, as far as the size and the, the, uh, the autonomous nature of those. Um, some of them will have, you know, 24 monitoring which could be involved somebody literally sitting in front of a monitor watching the system. Um, but it also could, could be somebody with um, that's multitasking and doing other things as well, but having visibility or access to quickly uh, visual. Uh, this is where it comes into having um, an event system that's able to, you know, notify. Um, you know, back in the day, notifications would came in through um, like a pager or even just, you know, dialing a phone number and letting somebody know that, hey, something has happened, uh, which may not necessarily be alarm, but might be, you know, a, a change, a state change. Like in this case, you know, where that would be identified that, okay, you know, we can do an event on that because if somebody needs to rec accept the fact, they can acknowledge that, oh, you've changed the set point. Yes, the set point has been changed. So 
you know, that the, there will be some variability to how that operates. So I don't know the details of this particular system, but the point is, is that, um, you know, observing or being, you know, having an, an ability to receive a notification of that a change was made and acting on it, um, I would hope that's typical. <laughs> yeah, I, I would. I would add to that is that so the system had to be designed either that you're sitting there looking at it and you yeah. catch it, mm-hmm. or the autonomous nature of it is that Jason's speaking about would be alarm conditions. Um, the the interesting, what we think is a fact, right, is that somebody was able to manipulate the set point. So the set point may or may not have been limited to a point where they actually need 11,000 parts per million. It might have just been, hey, I never did software assurance or any kind of code review to where, like, this is a ridiculous number. Um, so is, any- it, is that a ridiculous? I mean, well, obviously, we don't want that amount in there. But is that, well, a, uh, is that a ridiculous number? I think we, we should touch on that because I came up in one of the questions. So and I, I'm not sure it was not, um, efficiently addressed. When we look at this, this, this is an analog system that's pulling in water from whatever, a well or underground or what have you. And there will be variability to the number and types of minerals and the acidic levels that are being drawn into the system. So it's important that, that when they engineer this, that there is a variability as far as what the low and high numbers of these systems, of this you know, chemical needs to be introduced based on the conditions of the raw water coming in. Now to your question, yes, is, is that a ridiculous number? We don't know exactly. And, but I think what, what there is a capability though is you know, historical records, because they historically will record some of this, you know, data that they would be able to look, hopefully, be able to look back over time of the conditions of that raw water over a period of time or other, you know, changes that may happen environmentally, so that they would be able to then come back and say, okay, these are the, these are the reasonable limits that we could adjust for the system. Furthermore, you know, you could extend that buffer by putting mechanical limits that prevent. So even if the software limits may be put in place, there might be a little bit higher mechanical limits that could have been put in place and possibly having some level of um, uh, authorization in order to change those limits based on certain conditions or time of year or whatever. So that what that equates, though, at the end of the day, we have to recognize is that that all equates back to time and money right so right. but it so, is a good question yeah. i mean before before you go any further and and i kind of want to uh, um wrap this around because i think we're speaking at um uh, uh we're making references to certain terms that we need to uh, uh highlight just a little bit and uh help you know the people that are going to be listening to this so when we're talking about limitations within the application the uh, human machine interface the hmi that was uh, presented to the users, presented to the operators, and in this case, the attacker, um, has a, uh, um, a number that can be adjusted. And in this case, that number could go really high and really low, uh, starting at, and we'll just use it, the, the parameters that it was typically set at 100, and it allowed the um, operator to set it at 11,000. And in some cases, we may never, the, that application may never need to go above 500 as an example and in your in in uh, from what you're talking about if historically they've never pushed it past 500 then you can set a limit at 500 only allowing the operators through that application to um uh, to enter 500 rather than 11,000 so I, I um you know I wanted to explain that uh, Jeff and you and I were talking about how human machine interfaces can be configured to have that 500 limitation but then other devices uh, further down within the process might not have that built into. So can you elaborate on um, sure. uh, that case? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so we oftentimes have, um, I'm going to say knowledge that when we are putting set points on a human machine interface in HMI, and we start to think at that point, gosh, we should limit this between uh, something low limit and some reasonable high limit. And that may or may not have been done in this case. I don't know. But we also need to think about it from the PLC side, programmable 
logic controller side or PAC side or SCADA side or whatever. And it, so actually the device or the um, programmable controller that's controlling the actual output or the pump or whatever, a lot of times us PLC people won't enforce that same limit. So when we write C code or C++ code, we have a thought of, do we pass a bad parameter and catch the bad parameter? Or do we stop it from throwing it and don't worry about when we catch it? Or do we do it in both places? In an, in an automation system, we should do it in both places because people like you and people like Jason who don't use the tools and are teaching uh, or learning how to defend or attack something, you skip that HMI tool, you skip that layer. And so we need to make sure that we catch it in the lower, the lowest levels that we can. Yeah, the, 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 the HMI interface is really, it's the, it's to keep the operators working within their safety net. Yes. And so what Jeff's speaking is that there is an ability to work around that safety net, which is an unconventional method, yes. which an operator would not do. What's interesting about this one is that it, it sounds, and again, this is speculation, but it does sound very much like they use the system in the operator, in the conventional means to adjust that value. So if that was an allowed value because they may have to go to that level of parameter, 11,100, then okay, right? Um, that, we can talk more about that, but the point is, is that if you're going to have a set limit in the HMI, well, we need to start engineers need to start thinking around you know, the unconventional methods on how those values can be adjusted. Well so. said. Interesting. And, uh, and to come back around to what you were talking about um, in, in your statement, Jason, was uh, some of those physical um, uh, controls that we don't necessarily think of uh, from an mm -hmm. IT standpoint. When I, when I think about, I think about it from exactly the way we're talking about, which is uh, um, uh, ensure that the application has limitations that are appropriate for um, uh, the process uh, that the program logic controller has uh, logic in it that uh, um, uh, requires uh, um, or lim provides the limitations that we we're talking about. Uh, but when I was uh, um, you know talking with Tim Conway, um, uh, who's part of the, the, the Sands Institute, and you know and both of you today, you know some of the things that you went to around responding to these types of incidents, especially on the remediation part, you know was. Uh, you express the um, desire for uh, organizations to really look at the process for the physical needs. And as an example in this, when we're talking about the sodium hydroxide, when you pump it up to, you know, uh, 11,000 parts per million, you know, maybe that requires like a hundred gallons worth of that chemical when really they, they only ever use, you know, up to five gallons. And so instead of having a hundred gallon tank, that's available right there, having a five gallon tank that they can fill from uh, um, some other means. So um, is this the type of, uh, is that the type of physical control you're talking about? And do you see this used in the, um, in the different places that you've gone before? Yeah, that, that's, that's a valid um, perspective. I think, you know, when we're, when we're doing a, you know, consequence based, you know, impact analysis to understand, you know, essentially what, what level of breathing room do we have so, you know, they, they talked about briefly about this particular facility. They indicated that there was a propagation of delay for when the dosing was happening. There potentially, I don't know the details of the system, potentially before it left the plant, whether it's a high pumps or whatever, um, to go to distribution, they may have had an, an, another system that would have been able to look at a final take sampling of what was actually outlet of the facility. So, there would have been a delay. There's a there's a delay between when the dosing happens to when it shows up at the you know the door leaving the facility. So you know that would have been one area. But to your point is, yeah, there you know they there would have been limitations in how many you know gallons are available, but also just mechanically how much could they actually inject at any point in time. And we can't just go by the fact that the operator, um, I, I would not anyway assume that just because the operator is allowed to go 11,000, that it means that mechanically they can actually put 11,000 parts per million. Like I, I think the analogy that I shared with you before, I think kind of covers it. If you've got a, um, you know, if you've got a Viper and a Pinto up running, you know, with a set point at 60 mile an hour down the highway and somebody suddenly decides they're going to floor it, 
and they're going to set the set point to 200 mile an hour, right? First of all, the, 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 the rate of change is going to be completely different between those two vehicles, right? Mechanically, as well as, you know, potentially like the Pinto is going to stop well short of the Viper and even hitting 200 mile an hour, right? So the same analogy can be put into play here. Does it mean that we should forego all other security leading up to that? No. What it means is that is when you come in and you're doing a response or you're trying to understand, you know, the situation, then it gives us an understanding to know what the reality is. If you did that homework up front, and even if somebody was to bypass this, you would know, be able to quickly respond to understand what the environment was able to do to give you that breathing room. And, and I think they alluded to some of that, but, but that's the analogy or the, the, you know, this, the other tier that you can put in. So you could physically, purposely actually engineer in those limitations mechanically. So you could always prevent certain situations from happening. Um, I don't think everybody necessarily engineers it that way. They, they may, enge they don't engineer the limit for the standpoint of what should we not go past, but rather the requirement that comes in when they design the mechanical system is going to be, what do we need to be able to deliver? So it's possible they can over-engineer it to deliver three times more to ensure that they can hit that limit, that requirement. But then to come back later and tweak, you know, a little set, set screw or something to prevent it from going to the three times more, you know, is something that would be nice to see from- I'll Nick, uh, just a small, a small additional comment is that mechanical and process people, when they design a system, oftentimes that information doesn't get transferred in a, in a great way to the automation team. And so like, um, to Jason's point, if the mechanical systems is designed to do something, and I'll give you a real world example, machine I was working on was capable of generating more tonnage than it was ever supposed to because they wanted standard and stock valves. And so the mechanical people told us, hey, don't ever do this or you will break that. And so, um, I, again, getting to the getting to the mechanical engineers or the process engineers mind and bringing that and limiting the system is is a good discipline so uh, another thing that uh, tim brought up when i was talking to him and that, that kind of stuck in my mind um was the, the the cost of change and when we talk about the um and, and i'm still kind of talking about the uh, um the limitations in the application uh, uh, versus the limitations um in the actual design uh, and it, let, let's say they approached it from uh, updating the application. So protecting the application, um, uh, placing the limits on there, that software update to the HMI um, could probably potentially be pretty expensive, but it's really just changing the HMI. It's not necessarily changing the controller, depending on who the integrator is, who the, uh, uh, the people that are implementing the different components are. Um, and then, uh, so you'll have the cost of changing the HMI, You'll have the cost of changing the logic in the PLC, probably separate, um, uh, and then of uh, uh, you know potentially physical changes, physical limitations that are um, uh, not bypassable, like those other changes actually potentially are, um, and are are cheaper. So, what is your experience with? Um, how uh, municipalities are approaching some of these things. Are they thinking about this, you know, um, uh, uh, prioritizing some of these physical changes over the digital changes um, to help them address some of these issues? Um, I, I, I don't know that they've, they see them as both as tools in the same box that they could go to. So, you know, coming out of this type of event, I could see this being siloed into a, okay, team viewer didn't work for us, or maybe it did and somebody abused it or whatever. And then finding that is a problem, do want to figure out what the solution is, is and drive to fix that. And not necessarily bridging that to something else that they could have done, you know, if, if, the, if the event happened in a different method for future. So they, they you know, they would tend to what the initial in, 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 um, incident occurred and the access point, and they'll focus on that and not necessarily span that out. And there's reason for that. And one is, 
if you you can you can get yourself down a really a really big rabbit nest and then get overwhelmed with everything that should be done. And now you have some point you're like, oh my goodness, I, I, I don't have the capital to do all this stuff. And it, I want to highlight one thing about the, you know, we talk about a change of upgrading a platform, you know, from like a Windows 7 to a Windows 10 or, you know, whatever, you know, typically it involves an application change that also can roll because usually that opens a door to discuss for them to discuss, well, is this the time we move from one vendor to another? And, and municipalities very much are looking at those. And that's usually for, from the vendor side, it's an opportunity to try to get in them as a client. And from a user side, it's an, it's an opportunity to say, this vendor support hasn't been the greatest. So maybe we can shop around and find something else because it is public funding money and going to tender is much more uh, ideal than sole sourcing um, from another. So depending on the size of the upgrade. The other thing though, anytime you do an upgrade and I've and not just water, I've been across many of these is there's a configuration or an application change. And that is you're trying to do like for like because operations is very familiar with this setup and they're trying to move to something else that's different. And you're trying to get similar functionality and similar operate. You can spend a lot of effort and time just to make it look and feel the same. And that basically takes the funding away from doing and adding more security into it. So um, when, you know, uh, whenever I've gone into an organization and, and been looking at the uh, um, security program, you know, I've kind of tried to emphasize uh, the, um, uh, the role of the vendor and the inter I'm usually vendor and the integrators. I'm usually dealing with the security team or the, the OT team that's right there. They're conversing with me. Um, and I try to get them to bring those other people in because I know how valuable they are. They've configured things, they've set things up, but they've done it to specific requirements. So kind of going back to what you're talking about, Jason, you know, when uh, um, like updates, you know, what is required for the OS, what is required for um, the software that's, the, that's being implemented. Um, a lot of organizations are um, looking to the vendors and integrators to provide those security recommendations and implementations, but the integrator, the vendors and integrators are saying, give us the security requirements and we'll, and we'll do them. So, um, you know, Jeff, if you want to take this one, what's your experience around, I, I know requirements are required, you know, that are important to get up front. So how are vendor, how should we be holding vendors and integrators responsible around those? Should they be defining those or, is it the organization's job to, to give them all the requirements associated with security? Sure. No. So uh, it's actually a great question. And, and there's a gap in this today. Um, the gap being where do requirements come from? Well, they typically come from a customer, like what I want this thing to do. They come from mechanical engineers and process engineers. This is what it does. And then it ends up kind of being like an upside down wedding cake. So everything that you do from a control systems or electronics perspective is based on what the mechanical process system was supposed to do. And that knowledge doesn't get conveyed into an automation spec or into a security spec. And so what actually Jason and I did an interview with Control Magazine and we talked about this very thing and what, what is it? It is taking those, um, taking and understanding the systems as far as criticality and then relaying that to the machines or to the vendors or the SIs that have to control it. So in many cases, it's only the end user operators that can actually understand the personality of the process or the machines that you're actually controlling. And then that needs to get sent um, you know, documented and talked about with system integrators or people that are coding it, because that's kind of that's kind of where everything starts. At the end of the day, the difference between an IT security and OT security is our actionable, our, our items are actionables. They are actually outputs, and they are controlling some physical process. And so, understanding that physical process is just paramount. And a lot of times, the gap that exists in today's security programs is they don't understand the physical process that they're actually. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think, I think it's coming from the IT side. 
of the OT, if you will, or the ICS, right? Mm -hmm. Too many acronyms. The, uh, but I do want to put out there is that there's a couple things. One, the American Water Work Association is very much working towards having to being able to put the, like they've actually have um, what could be used as a, a benchmark to say for, for consultants and SIs to say, you need to, you know, we want to meet these milestones. So there is an ability to work with those organizations to help achieve it. Um, I've done uh, in the water facilities I've been in, that's, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're going back many years, but the point is that some, some of them, you know, they're getting a spec and they're like, yeah, we want to do security and the consultants. Great. Let's do some security. And, you know, it's like, okay, we'll put a line down that says it needs to be secure. Okay, mean? great. Right. <laughs> Wonderful. And then the, the other side to that is it goes to, I don't, we can go down the whole rabbit hole, but it goes to a, a um, design bid build process. So a consultant will design it. They will establish a requirement that requirement that goes to bid and where we really get interesting. And this is not just a security thing, but overall is in the bid process, they will literally go through each line and come up with an equal cost associated to it. So it's the issue is that if you don't clearly define all the things you want security wise, and you say, I want complex passwords and I want a secure remote access. And then they just go through and say, okay, that costs this much and that costs this much. And not only as they won't necessarily go farther and beyond what the bid is, if it's going to impact their bottom line, they're left short with an opportunity to add more good, gooder <laughs> security on top of that. Mm -hmm. But then um, when, when it goes to the build and the other thing is, is that lastly is that, it, then that's what's kind of has been feeding into security being as part of a pro improvements as being part of a project and not as part of a program. And when you go to these small municipalities to run a security program is extremely hard because the opportunity for them is during a project. Now it's a matter of, okay, well, can you get the tools in or the requirements in so that that project can build a foundation, but then now we're left with, how do we put a program on top of that so that it's continual? And it doesn't have to be, you know, a super crazy expensive program, but it's got to be a starting point so that we can start feeding in some of these, you know, great opportunities to we can do certain things to, to lower or, or shrink that attack surface overall and, and give them a fighting chance. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, uh, um, the, uh, what you were referring to was the uh, the, the water ISAC, um, and they do have the the cybersecurity fundamentals. It's a document that they put out that's available mm -hmm. to you know to to all the water facilities, uh, and they can leverage that as a part of uh, um, how to prioritize their approach uh, to their security program. So I'll, we'll definitely put a link to that um, uh, down in the uh, uh, the show notes. Yeah, those are two. Just to clarify, there's those are the two two organizations. Oh, there's two. Okay, water ISAC. And the American Water Works Association okay. are, are both in that uh, help support. And for those that are listening as well, as American Water Works Association also extends into Canada as far as supporting some members and so forth. So, excellent. So I've, I've been I've been talking about things from an IT and IT security. So what 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 am I miss? What am I not bringing up that uh, in both y'all's minds uh, um, is important around? Uh, this conversation? Uh, I think the one thing we should talk about is the um, difference between doing IR and IT versus doing IR and OT. So instant response in IT, you know, I'm not going to talk about that. That There's well documented. It's, it's well, well understood. Um, and I don't just say this as an instructor to the ICS IR part of, of SANS, but the IR and OT, I think, you know, we, we just want to emphasize is that, you know, the ability to, the, one, especially when we're talking about water, is we can't just shut down a water facility, if it's a water treatment facility, and in some ways, a, even a wastewater facility, because things are constantly flowing. So, but in the water treatment side too, is if there's, there is a, you know, the community has a dependency on that on those on that service and so 
you know, what, what it means is that there is usually some kind of buffer in place um, of clean water that's been, you know, blessed, if you will, but they need to be able to verify that that is, is good. If, and I bring that up only because if, for instance, all your tanks are full, you know that you're confident the water is good or it's safe or whatever, even if you're not, you know, you have to be able to deliver it. And why is because, you know, if you look at one area of service is, you know, fire hydrants, you have to be able to have, and the other thing too is pressurization in the water. If you, if you bring the pressure down on the pipes, you know, potentially you, you can suck in contaminants from underground and soil and everything else in your distribution. So the point is, is that you can't just shut servers down. You can't just isolate servers because they are dependent. And the other thing is dependent too is from an operator standpoint, that is their link into the system, right? They, there's been a, I went through a whole thing where they were trying to find the right solution so that an operator could walk around with a tablet when they're doing their checks because they had to have good visibility. Before what they did is they had a microphone set up to the speaker on the computer and for the PA system and they turn it on so that if an alarm went off, they would find the nearest station and deal with it. But if you, and you could speak of ransomware on the impact of this, but the point is, is that when you're dealing with these systems, uptime is still paramount even during an incident. So you have to be able to figure out how do I do that but also how do I validate that the water I already produced that's either out in distribution or in the water tanks is good has so, not um, been tam tampered with. So, I mean, go, going back to your um, incident response standpoint, you know, when, when we look at utilities and, and we think about, um, you know, them going down, having a compromise, but still being um, still requiring a, a, um, a level of service uh, and, uh, you know, we've been recommending and um, uh, especially in the United States, um, being able to go back to manual operations, being able to like not have the communications with those substations. And I imagine it's similar to for these water facilities, larger facilities are going to be like what you talk about, um, which is they're, they're going to have that digital requirement to understand what uh, across the large number of components, smaller facilities, potentially like this one, but I'm not sure, um, may be able to go back to manual operations. So what is y'all's experience around that? Yeah, uh, anyway, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll just add one piece to that. Yes, it, it, that, I should mention the degree that that is a thing. Um, what I think people need to do is put a program around it and test it regularly. Um, because it's one thing to say, yeah, we know it, we designed this, we bought this panel and it comes with local push buttons and it's supposed to do what it's supposed to do. But I've been on an incident where um, overflow pumps during a rainstorm weren't able to turn on because, and even at the local control panel, because no, nobody's ever tested it. And so they were, you know, unfortunately it didn't work out well for them. But the point is, is that you got to test it. Even if yeah. you, one, don't remove them. There's, there, was an, there was a suggestion that was floating around to reduce costs to remove some of these features and capabilities or make it as minimal as possible. So my point is maybe you should just go out, test them and see whether it's capable for the reasons you mentioned. And, and the testing, I mean, from my experience and from the people that I've talked to, uh, the, it, it's one thing to have those capabilities still in place and, and because the, those pieces of equipment are usually there. But as you move towards digital, your personnel rotate out and now all of a sudden you have these people that are trained up only on the digital and when they have to go back to manual operations, all of a sudden that knowledge base isn't there. They actually have to go out and call people that have retired ask them to come in to uh, do assistance as consultants and so forth. Yeah. So, or you don't realize you need five people on staff to do it, not just one. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Yeah, it is. It, and I get, again, most of the OT professionals understand and are pretty good at doing things like making redundant process controllers and redundant HMIs where we tend to fall apart a little bit is redundant networks. So, we OT people are starting to up our game on the networking side and the security side a little bit. But what will happen is they'll engineer um, a redundant control system 
they'll engineer a manual system and then the network falls apart. And so there is still a huge need for a marriage of IT skills, you know, switches, routers, and firewalls, that professional understanding of security systems married to an OT staff. And so there's never going to be just IT getting smart enough to run control systems or OT without IT knowledge of, you know, switches, routers, firewalls, security, all that stuff. So the long story short is even in, you know, water or food production, things that just can't stop. Like I deal a lot with poultry industry. Then, you know, the poultry is coming in one end and you're going to do something with it or whatever. So long story short, same with water. You're just not going to turn it off. And so you need to understand what happens when catastrophe day happens. Yeah. You go, you go do the manual controls, you restore. I think uh, we talk highly of Tim Conway. Tim Conway has a wonderful slide that talks about if you're here, do this. If you're already compromised, then there is the restore activity. How do I restore and get back to somewhat normal? And so those, those activities don't ever stop. Yeah. And we should also mention even in manual control, um, these facilities, you know, there, there's, there is a, a regulatory control to audit the quality of the water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that if, if they want to truly operate without some kind of server that's logging that every 10 minutes of taking chlorine count, you know, they, they have to come up with another means to, to bypass that. I had one, it was a chemical facility and their, their historian, uh, anyway, it broke the, uh, We'll just leave it at that. They, 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 they actually had a guy sitting in a chair, literally looking at a gauge and writing down a value every five minutes. And that was his job because if they weren't able to do that, they would have been completely in uh, violation um, with uh, the environmental folks. So we have to recognize too, is that there's a, that that's a cost. And that's also, you know, that takes that person away from being able to do other things to do recovery. Um, it also means that if somebody's doing instant response in there and they don't recognize the type of system that they're on and they reboot it or they crash it um, or, you know, they don't look to see whether it was actually compromised, even though they're looking at this thing over here, you know, there's, there's, there's other aspects I think that we just need to recognize. We're not looking necessarily if it's a true IT, OT type of attack like this. You know, it's it's not just that there was a breach and somebody stole some information, right? We're talking about it's a breach and somebody manipulated something mechanically while at the same token had pure access to all the other things that are on that network. So there's a lot to look at. I would, I'm just going to add one comment to that. And that is, um, it is easy to shoot at the people who are under duress and say, why didn't they do this? And why didn't they do that? Yeah. And, um, or why don't you just patch or why don't you just, there's a lot of smart people in these different environments that have done the best that they can with the monies that they had. Um, it, it is, if you have lots of money and lots of resources, your, your path to the future and your security plan looks a lot different than if you have, very limited budget and very limited resources. It's, it's much, much different. So. Yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, in, in my mind, and I, I don't want to say I was glad that this happened, uh, but I can see value in, in the fact that this happened and got a lot of media attention uh, because of the fact that people are going to be starting to ask questions. Now um, leadership is going to be looking at this and saying, are we in the same position? How do we avoid this? Mm -hmm. What are uh, current operating uh, procedures? How are we pre uh, uh, preventing against this? So uh, hopefully we'll be more secure around this. You know, uh, hopefully this knowledge gets out to um, uh, those individuals that are providing the funding, providing the um, uh, um, uh, mandates uh, um, to implement these things security securely. Excuse me, and uh, and move forward because uh, that's all we can do. We can just move you know, move forward with these um, systems that are already in place and hopefully uh, get ahead of these situations, make it more difficult um, to do these types of things and then follow up quickly when they do happen because they will eventually happen. So, um, you know, uh, we're probably getting uh, pretty close on time. Um, so uh, 
you know, if, uh, Jeff, you are, is there anything that uh, um, you'd like to add? I you know anything uh, um, uh, about this. Yeah, I, again, double down on monitoring. So um, long, long time ago, I was in a class with Ed Scotus and I was, I'm sure I was annoying to him because I'm like, we've got these old, old systems and you can't do half the things that you're talking about. And so in a frustrated moment, he says, if you can't do anything, just double down on monitoring. So getting, you know, in this particular case, there was a person monitoring what was happening and overrode those. We need to make sure that uh, Jason mentioned norms, you know, understanding and baselining norms, understanding when unusual activities occurring. And uh, so my advice is if you, if you have a con old control system, then we need to double down on monitoring so that we know what's going on, at least get some visibility of what's happening. Excellent. Jason, yeah. uh, final thoughts? Uh, the, the first thing is, yeah, I mean, there's, I would say definitely want to jump in. Anybody who has any remote access to their facility, it doesn't matter what it is, we can, if it's TeamViewer, wonderful. If it's somebody else, even if it's VPN, if it's a home brewed system, it doesn't matter. This is a great opportunity to, you know, check your logs, like, you know, monitoring, but also, you know, re review the, the, um, the requirements that were used when they built those systems and see if there's ways to improve on it. But also I'd like to, you know, something that I've always, if you have a, a master plan, you know, review it next time you're reviewing it or open it back up and consider of how we can start, you know, how to bring in a security program that carries through from project to project instead of just look working at is like, okay, today we're gonna do this upgrade and then we're gonna go move on and do something else. You know, try to look at how you can tie those together. Um, I think small municipalities and counties and other things need to start banding together to, to work closer. And they could probably pool some funding to help in that space, not just from a prevention and a monitoring standpoint, but also, you know, how do, how do we deal with response? You know, I, and I, you know working with, Service organizations like DHS, FBI, and your local law enforcement, I'm not saying take away from that, but you also, you know, you have uniquenesses that need to be addressed. So make sure those are accounted for in those, in those strategies. Excellent, excellent statements across the board. Um, you know, I really appreciate you both taking some time um, uh, to sit down, you know, your conversations with y'all on, on these types of things always educate me and, and, and go really far. So I really appreciate it. Uh, for everybody that's listening, um, that we mentioned a few things uh, in this. Uh, you know, we'll obviously we'll put some links down in the show notes. Uh, SANS, uh, the SANS ICS uh, program, we do have the IC, uh, ICS community, and, and I'll put a link in the show notes to that, um, where we uh, have people from the industry discussing these things. Um, Jeff and Jason and myself and Tim uh, are, all participate in that forum. And uh, actually, Tim put out uh, so a slide deck associated with some information around uh, um, this event, uh, uh, some key points that uh, come from this team uh, specifically, and uh, that can be presented to leadership. We're actually, uh, it's a, a PowerPoint presentation, so people can, uh, um, as a part of the community, can include that in their presentations for the leadership. We will be making a blog post around this as soon as we get done here. Um, uh, we're going to write up some notes on this and uh, we will have a PDF version of that uh, as a part of that. So um, once again, Jeff, Jason, uh, thanks for you know sitting down. I hope we can do this again. Um, hopefully it's not for another incident like this. We can just talk about some topics that um, uh, are near and dear to our hearts. But, uh, uh, you know, thanks for showing up. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Thank you for tuning into this ICS Hot Take with the SANS ICS team. If you'd like to join the SANS ICS community, please check the show notes for links to the community and other resources provided by the SANS ICS team. If you have comments about this topic, please add them to the comments below or reach out to the SANS ICS team directly. If you would like to see more content like this, please like and subscribe to the SANS ICS channel. Thank you and have a great day.